Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Onyx. On today's episode, I am joined by Michael Easter. Michael is the author of the new book, The Comfort Crisis, a professor at UNLV, and has been a writer for magazines such as Men's Health for years. We talk about his reasoning for writing The Comfort Crisis, which is the best book that I've read in a long time. 33 Days in the Arctic of Alaska with Donnie Vincent, Why Boredom is Important, Masogis, The Health Benefits of Rucking, and much more. This episode is brought to you by Onyx, and the Onyx Hunt app is your premier GPS hunting app that turns your phone into a working GPS. This time of year, I'm scouring over maps on the desktop version of the app to look for areas to scout during the spring, as well as potential hunting locations for my annual western hunt the new 3d feature makes it convenient to look for hidden benches and understand the lay of the land if you want to check out the onyx hunt app for yourself head over to onyxmaps.com and use the coupon code emw to save 20 percent tethered is a company that's founded on the principles of educating the hunting community on saddle hunting while creating the most innovative lightweight safe products for saddle hunting I'm using the Phantom Saddle System with the Predator platform for all of my mobile hunts. To learn more about tethered and saddle hunting, head over to tetherednation.com. Maven is building the highest quality optics at half the price of their competitors through their direct-to-consumer business model. They want to create the best optics for the job, period. Their products are back with a lifetime no-fault warranty and an incredible customer experience. Maven just released a new RS5 4 to 24 by 50 millimeter single focal plane rifle scope. It's built for those who require the precision of long range dialing with fine reticle benefits of a second focal plane. You can use the coupon code EastMeetsWest gift for a free gift with any full price optics order at mavenbuilt.com. And last but not least, Spartan Forge. Hunters require an accurate forecast of the best hunting days and the best hunting spots to save time on scouting and actually executing the hunt. The Spartan Forge Outfitter utilizes years of military background and machine learning to pull from millions of data points to accurately predict deer movement, including GPS data, 30 years of weather, academic and state research. They're using science rather than someone's opinion to figure out the movement for your specific hunting area. You can use the code East Meets West to save 25% off of the outfitter at SpartanForge.ai. All right, on this week's Mountain Buck Story of the Week, or otherwise known as Mountain Buck Monday over on social media, this one comes from the Instagram page 34 Outdoors. And it goes, Our crew member McNoli took this buck back in the 2019 season. It was the second week of the general rifle season. He took on a morning when we had a big cold front move in. He hiked up and was perched on one of his favorite glassing knobs and watched a number of cow elk feed out of the drainage he was glassing. As the clouds lifted and the elk moved over the ridge, he shifted his glassing position and that's when he spotted this guy bedded on the lower third of a main ridge basking in the sun. He snagged a couple quick picks through the spot the spotter before setting up. He waited for the buck to raise from his bed. The buck no more than stretched his legs before he sent a 7mm round right in the sweet spot at 35 yards. It was a hunt he'll always remember as it's his biggest mountain buck to date taken here in northwestern Montana. We love your podcast. Keep the mountain buck podcast coming and can't get enough of them. Well, thank you for sending that story in. It's actually funny. I... They had sent this story in last summer, and I'd missed it. I mean, I had seen it and had it saved to post here and just realized I never posted. The pictures are beautiful, so I have them over on the East Meets West Hunt Instagram page and East Meets West Outdoors on Facebook. You can check those out. Um, su- such a cool buck, and I love the the Western mountain buck stories. Pretty cool. So keep all of the mountain buck stories coming. I love sharing them and talking through it. So, um, 
In other news, we have the Mountain Buck Scouting video series. A new episode is dropping this week that is focused around hunting the rut, how to scout from e-scouting, how to get boots on the ground, and then how to actually capitalize on the hunt during the rut when most of us are taking our time off. So check that out on my YouTube, which is just under my name, Bo Martonic. And if you like it, give it a thumbs up, comment, subscribe, share it with your friends. It's all really, really appreciated. I just got back, so if you may realize this podcast came out a little bit later than it normally does, and it's because I was out in Montana visiting my brother, and the travel was terrible trying to get back. I tried to get back on Sunday, and I didn't get back until Tuesday morning, so it was almost 48 hours of time in the airport with delayed flights for maintenance reasons and then they didn't have any fuel for the plane um then weather problems it was just it was terrible (laughs) trying to trying to get home but i did make it back it was an awesome trip get visit my brother kurt who um he's a gunsmith that works for c c sharps and out in um big timber montana and so i got to go to the factory or where Kurt does his work with gunsmithing and stock building and seeing how they make these old vintage rifles that are custom built for the customer. And it's, it's pretty cool to see that process. And he, my brother always went, he went down kind of a a rabbit hole of guns when I went the archery route at a young age. And he's extremely talented at what he does and loves these guns. I got to go out and shoot his uh custom built 4570 black powder rifle that he had built for himself that he's planning on hunting taking on all of his big game hunts this year it's uh it's pretty cool i got a video of us shooting that over on my instagram page you can check it out and also we got to i went hiking with him and his wife abby and their two dogs and we hiked up to a a high country lake and did fly fishing. So I've never fly fished in my life before and never even held a a rod. It uh, is something that I knew I love, but I didn't want to have another time consuming, expensive hobby. (laughs) So I've avoided it up to this point, but I can see why it's, it's so fun. Caught uh, my first couple trout on the, the fly And we did that actually didn't find any in the lake, but in the stream that was leading up to the lake, um, you know, that was cutting through the mountain there, we were able to find a pool of fish and, and get on them there. Um, and it was just, um, it was a really cool, really cool trip. I love it out there in Montana. Uh, (laughs) makes me want to live there. It's just, just a really, really cool place. And it was a good time getting to, to see my brother there so anyways on this episode i have michael easter as i said the author of the comfort crisis a writer and just in a professor at unlv he is an extremely intelligent and passionate writer and this book that the comfort crisis i just finally finished it completely and it is literally one of the best books i've ever read and definitely the best one i've read in in recent times highly recommend you check that out i'll throw a link in the in the bio here if you're interested in in checking that out but anyways uh, with that being said let's uh let's talk to michael here hope everyone has a great week all right we're live Michael Easter, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on, Bo. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good to talk to you. It was right before we started um, recording here. You said it's a nice hundred and five degrees in Las Vegas right now. Yeah, something like that. Hundred, hundred and five, hundred ten, hundred twenty. What's the damn difference once you get into hundreds, right? Yeah, yeah. Th- those are those are just numbers we don't see too often here in Pennsylvania. I can tell you that, if ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I will say it's very dry to dry heat. So you don't like sweat out going outside for more than a few minutes. So, I mean, I'll, I'll take it over a super humid day anytime, to be honest. You you know, what's, what's funny is like, I I noticed that when, when I first started going out West hunting, my first trip was in 2016 and I had never been West of the Mississippi and, and 
I'm used to humid heat when it's hot. And I got out to the mountains and I'm like, you know, how am I supposed to go for this many days with only one pair of clothes and all this stuff? Well, I didn't sweat nearly as much or like it wasn't a sticky, you didn't feel gross. Cause yeah, it was so where were you? Heat. I was in Colorado and okay, the Rocky yeah. mountains there. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Nice. It was, it was, it was just funny the the difference in that. I've always heard of, you know, a dry heat, but never understood exactly what it was until, until I experienced it. But yeah. But anyways, so Michael, I'm, I had you, I asked you to come on the podcast here to talk. You're the author of The Comfort Crisis and you've written for a lot of different magazines. I'll let you kind of talk about yourself here in a minute. And I've been thoroughly enjoying your book and I, and I not saying that just cause I'm talking here in front of you, but I've been recommending it to a lot of people as I, it's one of my favorite reads that I've had in a while and probably my favorite so far this year. So I, that's awesome. I'm glad to have you on. Let's put it that way. Dude, it's awesome to be here. And I'm, I'm super psyched. You like the book. That's uh that definitely means a lot coming from you and thanks for spreading the word of mouth. That's uh huge for us authors. It's like, that's the best thing that can happen to a book is someone reads it and they like it and they tell someone else about it. And hopefully that splinters off into a sort of, you know, virus like effect. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem at all. So as we get started here, let's just give me a background on yourself. Who are you? How do you kind of get into writing and what you do in that space? Yeah. So I, um, <clears throat> I grew up in Utah and I'd always been into books and magazines and stuff. And I end up in college and I pick a major that is completely at odds with that, which don't ask me why. Uh, but sometime around my junior year, I realized like, oh, you like to write, you like to read, you should get into this thing. Now, I graduated college the same year that the economy just totally collapsed in 2000, it was 2008. And so I was the class of 09. So we were like, there wasn't much to do. There wasn't any jobs. It was either, you know, go back to you. Yeah, I went to college out in Massachusetts. It was either go back to my mom's basement or maybe <laughs> go to grad school. So I was like, well, grad school sounds tough, but maybe better than the basement. So I went to uh, journalism school in New York city for a while. And cause I figured, you know, that would sort of give me a springboard into writing. And then I would have something that was actually writing related on my resume. Like I had nothing, you know, it's like, yeah. I can't apply for a magazine job with nothing on there. Um, <clears throat> so through that, I ended up working in sort of small jobs at scientific American and GQ and Esquire. So I kind of had these, these two, I guess I'll call them dude magazines and this one like super sciencey magazine, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, because of that gig, I ended up getting getting a job at uh, Men's Health. And I worked there for a bunch of years. And I was kind of, you know, I started with a lot of their fitness sort of content, which I was kind of always like, eh, this is interesting, but, you know, not really. I was always a lot more interested in um, characters and places and sort of interesting people, I guess, doing interesting things in interesting places. And I started writing those stories and kind of embedding myself in places and worked out. It was a lot of fun. Um, Eventually I decided I wanted to leave the job for whatever reason. It's like, once you, once you get to a certain place in a magazine, you start writing less and editing more, et cetera, et cetera. So I took a job at UNLV where I teach journalism because that job is essentially half teaching and then half continuing to write. So I still write for a bunch of magazines like men's health, um, outside done some stuff for like men's journal and vice and just kind of a, you know, a wide range. And then I wrote this book. So that's kind of the thing that I've been focusing on now. Yeah. And, and so this is your first book then. Yeah, it is. Oh, that's what, what was that like? Um, you know, going from writing articles and everything to writing an entire book. It was, um, awesome. So to give you some <laughs> sense of what writing a magazine article is like, sometimes it's not even my idea. It might be my editor who's like, Hey, we have this idea. We need someone to write it. Will you write it? Then I go out and I write it. Like I think it should be written and the information that it needs. And I pass it back to an editor and he or she goes, no, you need to do something totally different. So by the time that product gets out in the world, it's gone through bunch of rounds of edits. It's gone through a person above my editor, a person above him. And it is like this thing that is 100% men's health's property or outside magazine's property. With a book, it's like, 
I come up with the idea. I develop a book proposal. I find someone, you have to find an agent to help you sell it, which sounds totally pretentious, but that's just, you know, kind of yeah. how it works. Um, but it's hundred percent yours. And if someone wants the book, um, you work with a single editor and mine, I had a really good one. And so he commissioned my book at 85,000 words, I think, which is about 300 pages. Um, but I sent him like 200,000 words <laughs> just cause I tend to overwrite, like I yeah. just over explain stuff. So his job was really just like getting big chunks of text and just hitting the delete button. So it was at the end of the day, it was like a hundred percent mine still, you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, oh. like he didn't rewrite, rewrite it, didn't do anything. And doing a book where you have that much space to really think and explain is so much different than magazine work where you're like, you have 2000 or 3000 words to explain this thing. And like, you can't really go off in these avenues that you think are fascinating. It's all decided by someone who like has this vision of a reader in their mind. Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, no, what's interesting about what you just said there is, so I've, I started writing, uh, for some magazines back in 2018, just only three or four years ago, essentially. And, and when I started writing, I didn't realize that like when I had written stuff for myself, it was just me coming up with it and everything. And once I started getting the magazine world this year, I actually quit writing for a couple of publications that I was because I hated that. I don't, I didn't like the idea of someone telling me this is what I want you to write about. This is the stuff I just, and I, and I've learned that that's just the way that it is in, in those situations, but I didn't, I was not a fan of it whatsoever. So I went to just start writing for, um, companies, blogs and websites that gave me more the, of the creative side of it to be able to do it. But I, yeah, I didn't like when someone would take what I said and make it fit a certain narrative yeah. that, you know, the, and that wasn't what I was trying to say or what I believed in or anything along those lines. So I, yeah, I, I can, yeah. I can understand how, you know, how that would be. And, and that's cool about how, like you said, you wrote, you know, 200,000 words when you had 85,000 or whatever it was that to, to be able to do that and cut it out. When I tend to write, I, I tend to definitely go like a lot of my blog posts online are 800 to a thousand words and I'll write like 2,500 and I'm like, man, mm -hmm. I, I got to cut this back <laughs> and figure out how to, how to, you know, cause uh, you know, I, I, when I read your stuff, I, I love like what, when I read the book here is just like, the, the amount of detail you go into there. So I can't imagine what you cut out. Cause I felt like there was a ton of detail in it and you've, you've interviewed, you said you like talking to interesting people and you talk to some interesting people in this book. Yeah. Like it's, it's incredible the way that, that you went through that. But yeah, um, yeah I can definitely understand that. And like, I, I think from a, um, from the perspective of someone who, well, I guess I'll back up. I had a guy who was kind of my mentor in grad school, he, super smart guy, good journalist, won a Pulitzer Prize. I mean, that tells you with the level this this guy was out. And he one day just looked at me and goes, dude, you're going to write one magazine story a year that you really like. The rest is just paying the bills, you know? So I think with a book, it allows you to be like, this is the one thing I like and have it breathe more. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the cutting process is definitely hard. So you know, in the book, like you sort of alluded to is, uh, I talked to a lot of different people and I'm sure we'll get into like the hunt that I did with Donnie in the Arctic. Um, but beyond the Arctic, like I traveled to Iceland, to Bhutan, um, went up to Harvard and met these researchers, met these special forces guys in Florida, met this super, super genius kid in Austin who like used to work with the hell's angels and just all these wacky characters. So writing some stuff and getting attached to characters and then having to cut that stuff was sometimes like, Oh man, this sucks. But at the same time, like the question was, is this information feeding back into the overall thesis of the book, which is the world has become very comfortable in a lot of ways. We've removed challenge. We've removed effort. Uh, everything is easy nowadays. And because of that, it's hurt our health in a lot of different ways. Right. So it's like, you think of the average day of the average person. And it's like, you wake up in a soft bed and a temperature controlled home, and you have really easy access to food for most people, unless you're a, you know, a hunter, it's probably this ultra processed stuff you got at the grocery store. There's nothing wrong with that, but we don't ever have to really, um, 
put a whole lot of effort or be challenged in our daily lives. And when you look at the data, the, re- the results of that is we've removed effort as we've made everything sort of easy. Um, it's pretty overwhelming that it's, you know, associated with the huge rates of obesity we have with chronic disease. Um, and even just like people feeling like they don't have a lack of meaning because we're not spending time outside doing these things that humans evolved to do anymore. So we're kind of like, stuck in this, I guess you would call it a rat race. That's what Donnie kind of calls it. Yeah. So. No, that, that that makes total sense. And I think one of the reasons why I related to this book so well, not not just your story with Donnie that we'll talk about, but was just the, the things that you described once, you know, I've hunted my whole life, but I never, I never really did like a full on adventure style hunt where I was spending days living off my back in the back country until I went out West in 2016. And what I realized were all my weaknesses pretty fast. Like just even like I, I if you would have talked to me before I went out there, I don't need this phone like this, you know, that's not that important to me. And day three or four and you're not, you know, that's still pretty early in the trip, but when you don't have any way to text somebody or do anything, like it was just like, holy cow, this is, this is weird. And I just felt like a sense of anxiety that I was never thought that I would feel. And, and the, you know, when you're like, okay, I got to go down and get water a thousand feet down below me just to be able to cook my dinner tonight. And I'm already tired from hiking 12 miles today. And I got to drop down and do that. And everything and and what I you know learned from that was just it, it made me appreciate all the things more in you know regular life I guess and the things that I would bitch and complain about was like all right that's not that big of a deal at all and it it gave me a clarity that was something that well I ended up turning it into a business of wanting to learn more and be able to help people find those you know adventures and be able to experience it and. So I, I think just that was what really helped me relate to that. And I think as hunters that are listening to this and everything, I think you read it. It's just like, there's, there's so many things that, that we'll cover here that I can, that I could relate to on it. Yeah. I've definitely got a lot of outreach from hunters going, I never realized why I did this. And then I read your book and it was like, oh, these are all these things. Like I'd never really thought of that. And it's like, yeah, that's why I do this and why it means so much to me. You know, I mean, (laughs) hunters are passionate people and they're really interesting people. And I think they often get overlooked by like mainstream media, you know, it's a really, really, um, intense, um, thing to do. You have to really think about it. Um, you're out there embedded in nature. I mean, you know, the, I guess what I would call the granola sports, like mountain biking and trail running, like you're in nature, but you're not like, how far back are you? You're on a trail, right? I mean, hunters are like in it. Um, I just think hunters are like some of the most fascinating people ever, you know? I mean, that's why I, (laughs) for this book, why I tagged along with Donnie for a hunt, you know? Yeah. And, and so I had first, I'd first heard of you when you wrote the article on Donnie a few years back when you joined him on an elk hunt. Mm -hmm. And so I'd I'd like you to kind of explain what your first hunting trip looked like. Yeah. So, cause you, cause you didn't grow up a hunter, obviously is kind of what you alluded to there. Yeah, no, no. Um, I mean, I, I grew up in uh, North of Salt Lake city. So I grew up doing a lot of the granola sports, you know, yeah, (laughs) mountain biking, that kind of stuff, always outdoorsy, but yeah, I get assigned to do this story. I pitched this idea, um, to do a story on Donnie and like what he was doing. And, you know, he was kind of a lens into this trend of backcountry hunting. And I go, I meet him up in this town called Ely, Nevada, which is like Northeastern Nevada. And we just like bomb up into these mountains. We park this truck, like up this Canyon. And then we hike, you know, like 10 miles in and it's just totally like off the grid hunting and to like, you know, reinforce all the points that you just made. It's like, I'm freezing cold the entire time, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, everything we did took effort. I mean, we're, we're hiking around with uh, everything on our back and um, even going down to get water. To your point, we'd have to go way down to the spring, a spring that, you know, animals were shitting in, et cetera. <laughs> yep. I mean, it's like, that's the other thing, right? It's like yeah. kind of a rough and tumble, dirty lifestyle. And as you also mentioned about yourself, I'm like, I find my, I found myself bored for like one of the first times almost in my life, because nowadays 
we spend so much time engaged with digital media. Like phones are obviously very obvious. And so we have all this messaging, like use your phone less, use your phone less, but people don't realize like we spend on average 11 hours a day engaged with digital media. So that's like cell phones, computers, TV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of times when people go, I'm going to use my phone less, they just watch more Netflix and like your, your brain has no clue. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. So, so when hunting, it's like my cell phone doesn't work. Right. And I didn't bring a magazine, a book or whatever. And we're sitting there glassing for elk for like hours at a time. And it's just like, holy shit, this is so unbelievably boring. But what's interesting about boring and uh, about being bored, and we can uh, might as well just get into this yeah, now, is yeah. that um, so boredom is basically an evolutionary discomfort that humans evolved to have. And it would tell us that whatever we were doing at any given moment, uh, the return on our time had worn thin. So there was no lo- it was no longer benefiting our lives and giving us a survival advantage. So if you picture a scenario like, say you have this bush of berries, okay? When you go to pick it, you obviously you pick the easiest to pick berries first, right? Because you can get those easy, they're easy to reach. But the more berries you pick, the harder the berries are to find. Might take you like five, 10, 15 seconds to find the next one. Well, boredom kicks on because your return on your time invested has just worn thin. So boredom basically says, hey, do something else. It's like this discomfort, right? So if you're the berry picker, you're like, okay, well, maybe I'll go hunt. If we didn't have boredom, we would have just kept like doing this stuff that like didn't help us survive, you know? Yeah. So in the past, boredom was this thing that improved our lives, helped us come up with creative, creative ideas. It even great gave our brain a rest period, but ultimately it helped us. Right. Nowadays <laughs> we have all these easy, effortless cures and fixes for boredom. So now when I get bored, I can just go bing cell phone, right? Is that productive? Most of the time, not. No. Yeah. Sometimes, okay, but most of the time, not. Like the average person isn't going on their, pulling out their cell phone at a line in the grocery store and reading War and Peace. They're just not, right? <laughs> They're like on Twitter, um, you know, getting worked up about whatever the microaggression of the day is or whatever, you know? Um, so we've essentially like, engineered boredom out of our lives and we're paying for it with our attention for sure. Like you look at rates of anxiety and mental health problems, and even just like people's attention spans. Now it's all moving in the wrong direction. And it's all because we don't have these like stretches of, of being bored and allowing our minds to wander, to sort of reset and to also come up with ideas that are far more interesting than anything we'd find in a cell phone. Yeah. So what, what are some things that you kind of self-identified that you were feeling? I mean, I know you mentioned some of them there, but were there anything that you were like, I need to start working on this like right now, whether it be your phone or, you know, or, or whatever that might be. Was there anything? Yes. Yeah. So when it comes to boredom, I mean, like coming back from Nevada, I started thinking about this. And then when we, when we go into the Arctic, like, Boredom gets put on steroids because we're there for over a month, right? And I didn't bring anything. Um, I had my cell phone, but it's useless. It's a camera, essentially. And um, <clears throat> so once I've got back, I've had to think like, okay, how do you re-engineer boredom into your modern life? Because I found that when I was in the Arctic and you know, we're waiting for these caribou to roll through and I'm super bored, I would do often do something productive. Like I wrote a lot of my book and when that, the time on that had worn thin, I would like think of things like, oh, how would I get my Christmas list done? Or like, oh, look at how that mountain looks. Like how often do we really observe nature? You know, yeah, things like that now. So you're doing these things that are a lot um, more inward and have to do with a lot of creativity and they're like restorative, you know? So to try and capture that when you get back to the modern world. Now, the thing that I think people need to understand about cell phones and apps, at least for me, is that the people who engineer this stuff, they're like in labs at Stanford, 40, 50 hours a week, coming up with ideas to help us spend as much time as possible on this app, because that's how they make money. Yeah. And at least for me, a moron like me does not stand a chance against these like MIT engineers. Like it's just that that's just the truth. Like I'm not, you know, like once I start going down Instagram, it's just like, oh man. And then you look up and it's like, holy crap, like 30 minutes have gone by. Right. Yeah. Um, and they're, these people are really good at what they do. 
So I think for me, it's like, I just need to get the thing away. Right. So I spend a lot of time, like every day I'll go for a walk outside with just like nothing electronic on me. Um, I'll go for a hike or whatever. And I just won't bring stuff. Now, if I'm going way deep, I'll bring a phone because I live in the I live um, at the edge of the desert and especially in the summer, like if you get lost out there in the heat, like people die all the time, tourists, like 20 miles from the strip. It's crazy. Um, So I'll bring it for something super long or super long, but generally I just try to like have these times of complete removal. Even if I'm going to do an errand, it's like, just leave it. Like you drive around with the radio off and no cell phone. It's like, all of a sudden you're like, you realize you're thinking about something you never expected you'd think about, you know, yeah. and it can be beneficial and productive and creative. You know, and, and it, so what, what I've, since I've been reading your book, that, that chapter definitely hit me pretty good. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I call myself busy all the time. And then I go and I look at my phone and how much time I spend on it. You know, it's one of the things you talk about in the book. And it was like two hours and 45 minutes a day. And I look at where, where that, time and it's not unproductive things you know like which apps are being used instagram and all these different things and and it i was like all right i gotta figure i can't completely you know exit from it so i gotta find out ways to to limit that time and do things and even actually my girlfriend brought this up to me a while ago she's like you can't do anything without music playing like i always like cook and i got music blaring or i got a podcast Mm -hmm. on or i'm doing something and it's just like so I've been trying to do more things of like in silence or like, and what I've realized that when I'm like the happiest and when I enjoy things most, when I'm going out in the woods and I'm hiking, cause I'm not, you know, I'm always thinking of things and I'm always coming up with stuff when I need, you know, when I'm writing things or stuff for my business or stuff for at home. And like, I'm so, I'm so productive. And I did that on my drive home at a 10 hour drive home this past week, weekend, I was in an event and I went, through a period of time where I just didn't have the radio on or anything. And that was tough. Like it was tough at first. And I just, and I ended up coming up with a list of things that, you know, to think about. And just, I was just kind of jotting down as I was driving, you know, a bunch of different things that were coming to my mind, just random thoughts. And it was, it was interesting that when you do that, because us as hunters, you know, when you're filled with all these things, you know, often and distractions and phones and Netflix and all this stuff, and then you go sit and say, even sitting in a tree stand, like, so during my week off during the whitetail rut, I'll spend a week dark to dark sitting in a tree stand with most of the places that I hunt don't have cell phone service. Try sitting in a tree stand in one location where you can see 15 yards at max of nothing, you know, it's difficult. And it, you know, the, the mental wear on that was one of the things that I've realized that like makes me um tired more than anything else and i'm like so i'm trying to almost prep to do that and be able to be okay in your own mind so to speak and yeah. you know western hunts the same thing you're glassing like you said and and just there's there's so many different things that i i could see that being beneficial and, and definitely identified areas that i personally need to to work on with it and i'm sure just about anybody could Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's interesting what you said about your long drive, because you're like, you know, it was tough, but at the same time you got something out of it. And like, I almost compare that to a workout. No one wants to work out, but if you ask someone after they work out, if they regretted it, no one ever says, yeah, I regretted it. They're always like, man, I'm so happy I worked out. I'm so happy I did that. Right. So you have to go through this discomfort and this is the overall thesis of the book, right? Yeah. Getting good things requires going through discomfort. If something is super, super easy, it's probably not going to be that beneficial for you, right? Yeah. No, no, most definitely. And so, okay, so you went from, you know, that that hunt with Donnie in, in Nevada there to, you know, when you started writing this book and going up to Alaska, which I I actually had flown with the same pilot pilots oh, that yeah. you did. Um, I was in the same place. Uh, so I'd talked to Donnie about this when I did a, a podcast with him. So like when you're, when you're talking about these things and the names and the characters, like I could relate a hundred percent to it. Cause I just experienced it this past August. I love and, that. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. So it was, it was really cool. And, um, and so what w- explain about what that was like, like you spent 33 days 
Yeah. There. So, I mean, first off, shout out to Ram Aviation out of yeah. Kotzebue. Brian, who owns it, is the man. He's great. Um, man, a few words. Man, a few words, but man, he can he can land a plane, and that's all I really care about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we. I mean, so Donnie invites me, right? Because I'm, you know, like the when I said, you know, you get one good story a year that you're proud of in magazines. Well, that was my one. That that one about um, Donnie and backcountry hunting, and we just kind of hit it off. And I was like, you know, thinking maybe there's a book here. Like he had said, yeah, you should go on something longer with us. So I was kind of like all right, well, what would that look like? You know? And then he invites me up to the, to the Arctic, you know, and we're having this conversation at one point he had, he had debuted one of his, um, movies in where were we? Oh, Fort Collins, Colorado. So I flew to go meet him and, you know, be there at his debut. And we're having a conversation. He goes, okay, so, you know, this Arctic trip is going to be a lot more dangerous than Nevada. Right. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like how much more dangerous? And he goes 20 times. And I go, oh, 20 times? No, I can do that for sure. And he goes, well, could be 50, actually. Could be 70. Could be 90. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Here we go. But I sign on, right? And um, it's funny because, you know, we fly out there with Brian. And probably what I was most nervous about initially was the flights and those little planes, which is, it's just funny. And part of it's Donnie's fault. Cause he's like brutally honest. He's like, look, man, I'm not saying we're not going to crash and die. Like that's a real risk out here. It's totally possible, but Brian's a pretty good pilot, pilot, you know? So he'd got me all worked up, but, um, yeah, we go out there and it is just, um, it's Nevada on steroids, man. It's like, everything is turned up to, you know, 50, 70, 90 notches. Like the cold is that much colder and the landscape up there. I'm sure you've talked about this on the podcast, but it's just like unbelievable. Like the distance, you cannot get a sense of distance. You'll look at something and you'll think it's like a mile away and it's like three miles away. Yeah. The light is super weird because it's at this low angle and the ground is the tundra, which is the worst thing you could ever, ever, ever walk on. It's just like, yeah. Man, like I describe it in the book as a like a big mattress that's covered in partially inflated basketballs. Yeah. And those basketballs are tundra tussocks, which are like these tightly wound things of grass. And then the mattress in between them is like kind of just muck out there. It's like soft ground, like ice, all this crap. So it's either like you step on this mattress thing, which is hard to walk on because you sink, or you have to like climb across these little basketball tussock things, which if you you can easily roll an ankle. Yeah. So just everything like a mile out there is like five on a road, you know, and we're hiking around all day. Um, we'd spend some days glassing. So I'm reintroduced to boredom. Even just the cold is insane. Cause not to mention I'm coming from Las Vegas, dude. In like August, it's like 110 degrees here. And now all of a sudden I'm in whatever it is up there, you know, yeah. below freezing. And, um, <clears throat> I definitely found the discomfort <laughs> that I was looking for. That's for sure. <laughs> Starving the entire time. I mean, so we brought in maybe 2000 calories a day or so, and, um, probably burning like four to at the most eight a day. So I'm just like dumping weight super quick. And when you start to lose weight, we have all these like defense mechanisms against that, that, you know, we evolved to have, like when your body starts to lose weight, your, your body goes, Oh, we're in trouble here. So it just ramps up your hunger and starts to make you really obsessive about food. And there's actually really fascinating studies um, from the forties in world war II. There's this experiment called the Minnesota starvation experiment where they starve people and like saw what happened. I definitely went through all that. Like your body just like, it just starts wasting away, you know, and hunted for the first time ever, which was, you know, I'd never killed anything like besides a squirrel that ran under my, my wheels of my car, you know? And I mean, that was, like honestly a life-changing event, you know, it made me totally rethink my relationship to uh, meat and food, you know? Yeah. And so to, to, just to go back to a couple of things that you said there, that what you, how you described the tundra, that was, it was one of the better descriptions I've heard because there's so many different descriptions. And one of the ones that I also thought was really accurate was moss covered bowling balls. Oh, and, yeah, and yeah, cause, and, and I've talked about it on here a bunch with my, my, as my 
cameraman Justin calls it my bitch ass ankles because I'll, as a, <laughs> I roll my ankles quite a bit and like I just oh, kind of I just kind of I sprained them back in sports in high school and they just but I don't even notice it anymore like they'll just roll and he's and and uh, he so anyways he's making fun of me with it so I'm like I can't walk on top of these things because eventually I'm going down so you know trying to walk in between it like you said it's just like makes every step harder. And yeah. I, I remember the one day we climbed up on top of this this mountain and we were looking out and you're talking about how far away everything is and not being able to judge distance. You know, I've been in the mountains of Colorado and Idaho and stuff and got to see that. And that's big country. Well, this is just, again, a whole nother world. And I, I pulled out onyx on my phone so i was looking at the map and i'm like i wonder how far away that is and i could tell on my map and it was be like five miles that we were looking at these caribou and i'm like there's no way like it just didn't seem possible <laughs> that it was that far away and i could see beyond them and it was right. just like it was it was so incredible to feel so small in in that environment and just in like you said all those different discomforts and the food thing when, when I did, it was my second, it was my, no, my third hunt I ever did out West, but it was my longest where I spent 14 days out there. And I was only packing about anywhere from 2000 to 2,500 calories a day. And I was definitely burning, you know, a lot more than that. By the end of it, my immune system just took a shit. Like it went, mm -hmm. I got really sick and I lost like 18 pounds and I was Ooh. just like in a bad place. And that's when I realized that I, I needed to up my cal and you'll never be able to completely get rid of the deficit, but being able to, you know, increase that and figure out how I deal with those types of, in my body deals with those types of environment. But that, that feeling of hunger like that is, is like something that's difficult to be able to describe to anybody. Mm -hmm. And, well, you know, I yeah, I mean, I think, so that's, what's interesting is like humans more or less used to live these like rough and tumble lifestyles for like literally all of time. If you look at, you know, we're talking 2.5 million years, uh, the genus homo. And then within the last hundred years, we start getting all this like technology, everything starts changing. Right. So like at 10,000 years ago, we start farming, we start like having better food supply, but we'd still go through like famines and like to live was to put effort into life. Like if you're a farmer, they seem to work about the same as hunter gatherers in terms of physical activity every day. So life is still rough, right? hundred years ago, industrial revolution happens and we start to get all these things in our life that just start removing all this effort that we used to have. Like all of a sudden we don't just have food. We have it. We have food in abundance and the food that we have in abundance is like Twinkies and Big Macs, right? Like you never find any food that calorie dense in nature ever. So it's like, this world that we've sort of built up for ourselves, it's, um, I wouldn't say pray because that makes it seem like it's bad. Like the modern world is obviously amazing. It's amazing that people live as long as they do. It's amazing that we don't have to worry about starving. It's amazing that I don't have to like till a field for work. Right. But at the same time, like all this new stuff, it sort of preys on these evolutionary mechanisms we have that used to keep us alive but in this world we have now so much ease and comfort, it, they like no longer serve us. So, you know, you talk to like, when I talk to the, the guys at Harvard, these anthropologists, they call this an evolutionary mismatch is the, is the term they use for it. And it basically just means, you know, you have some adaptation that used to serve you, you put it in a different environment and all of a sudden it backfires. So I think it's good to come around. I think it's good to go back into that lifestyle that we have at one point, right? Like, Nowadays, when you look at a lot of the research, like on something like hunger, for example, people in the modern world, we just eat. We don't even really wait till we're hungry. Something like only 20% of eating comes from times when we're actually hungry, right? We just eat because it's like, oh, it's breakfast or oh, I'm kind of stressed or oh, I'm, I'm watching TV. I always eat M&Ms when I watch TV. You know, we don't have these times where it's like, man, I'm actually really hungry right now. I've gone without, I'm not getting enough food for all this energy that I'm expending. And um, I think sort of reintroducing a lot of these discomforts into our life in a variety of ways and hunting's a heck of a way to do it. It's really good for us. Yeah. It's, it, and that, that was another um, part of your book there that the hunger 
thing because I, I eat a lot and I eat all day and I <laughs> and you know and I feel like I'm hungry all the time but I'm not really hungry like I feel like a lot of it like I'll eat when I'm at my desk working I think it's a little bit of like of the boredom thing that kind of like you know I'm like I don't want to be doing this or whatever it might be uh, or stress induced eating or whatever it might be and and I find myself eating a lot and I've been trying to again that's one of the other things just be cognizant of it and, and, you know, understand, am I really hungry right now? Do I really need this? You know, and, and like, so breakfast, that's my favorite meal of the day. I love breakfast, love bacon and eggs. It's just my thing. And, but like, I'd get up, say super early to go hunting or anything. I'm, I'm not ready to eat, but I just ate because I thought that's what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to eat breakfast. And even if it's, at four o'clock in the morning and and you know it's just those things that you kind of you didn't really realize before that you were just doing it and and it's okay as far as like from a from a health standpoint for me personally like when I'm very active like during the spring summer early fall you get in the winter time and you're not doing as much physically that's when you start seeing some weight gain going on, you know? (laughs) Yeah, for sure. And it's, I think what's interesting too, is that like when you experience hunger, like in, in the context of, you know, modern life today, not like day 14 of a hunt and we just like, don't have that. I mean, that's, that's super uncomfortable, but you know, just like daily, if you experience like real hunger, it's not that bad. I think people actually get more worked up about worrying that they're going to be hungry and what is going to happen than they are about like the actual hunger itself. Cause once you feel it, you realize like it doesn't just keep growing and growing until your head explodes. It's like kind of comes and goes in waves Yeah. and then you eat, you know, you're going to have food. Right. And, and you're fine. And we also know that through research that there's some good things that happen when people become actually hungry and they start to sort of burn through a lot of the reserves, your body doesn't like burn your all-star cells, you know, it's burning through ones that are sort of dead and damaged. It tends to, and that can have a beneficial effect for your health. So I think that, uh, the purge too, that you went through in Colorado was probably a pretty good thing, you know, once a year going on like a long hunt and just really like kind of having this period where you lose a little bit of weight. Yeah, no, it, it definitely. And, and hunger is, it's, it's such an interesting thing and it's so much in your mind. Like once you get past it, like you're okay for a while, like you're not, you're not dying. You're fine. You know, there's, it's, it's one, it's just trying to get your mind through that point. Mm-hmm. And, and just like the, the whole entire just basis behind your book, I think is a lot of why people struggle when they do go on these long hunts because they're not used to that discomfort. They're not used to that all the time. And, and, you know, there was, there was a, a topic that you talked about in the book. Um, Misogi, is that how you say that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got yeah. And, uh, and so explain about what that is a little bit. Yeah. So I meet this guy writing this book. His name's Marcus Elliott and he is a Harvard trained doctor but he's kind of far out. Like he used to go to Burning Man all the time. He got through college by counting cards. Um, So he's like a little bit of a seeker, right? But he's also super brilliant. He leaves uh, Harvard Med School. He decides he's not gonna become a doctor. He's gonna become a sports scientist. He works with the Patriots, helps them. He's like kind of one of the reasons they started really winning because he reduced their injury rates. So what he does is he really applies like deep data and science to uh, sports with a lot of movement stuff and AI, like crazy, crazy data, brilliant guy. Uh, But he also knows that what improves humans and makes us more resilient can always be measured with science, right? It just can't. So he does this thing called Masogi. And uh, once a year, he and some guys, and some of them are professional athletes, like highest, highest level guys will do an outdoor physical task. And there are only uh, two rules. Rule number one is that it has to be really freaking hard. Rule number two is that you can't die. And then <laughs> there are two, there are two guidelines. So guideline one is that it should be kind of kooky. So it should be, for example, one year, they walked a 85 pound boulder under the Santa Barbara channel for five miles. So one would dive down, walk like 10 yards, carrying this boulder, come up, the next guy would go. And after, you know, five, six hours, they've made it across whatever. And the reason for that is because a lot of times in modern life, like we go out and we do things because 
We're trying to impress someone. We're trying to measure ourselves against someone. So it's like people will run a marathon sometimes, not because like, I want to see if I can do it. It's more like, well, my neighbor ran it in three and a half hours. I'm going to, I'm going to get 325. You know, yeah, that is measuring. You don't want to be measuring. This is only doing it for you. And then the second guideline is that you can't uh, tweet, Instagram, whatever about it. Because again, you're not doing it for likes. You're doing it for to, internally, right? For internal reasons. And what these do is you're essentially mimicking um, the hero's journey that this guy, Joseph Campbell, talked about, right? Where you look at all these different um, tribes and myths and you know, throughout time and space, and most cultures had some version of the hero's journey, which is like, you leave the comfort of your home, of your tribe or whatever it is, and you go do something often outdoors in nature, that's going to make you a better person. You have this, like this trying middle ground you go through. And, but by doing that, you learn something about yourself and you come out on the other side, like improved in confidence and competence. So it's like rites of passage, right? Tribes used to have like young men go out and hunt uh, lions, like the Maasai tribe would do. You had um, Native American tribes uh, would send young men out into the wild for like a week at a time with like no food, no water, just like you're going out there and you're going to learn something about yourself and you're going to improve because the idea behind doing this now, trying to mimic that is that we used to face as we're evolving, like true challenges right? This could be from like having to do some crazy hunt. This could be, um, having to migrate across the past or something, um, all kinds of stuff. And so we don't really have these true challenges anymore, but each time we would complete something like a hunt or, you know, make it across the past, we would learn something about ourselves and improve. So we're trying to mimic that through something like a Masogi, just like one day a year, pick something that you do not think you can do And that is judged by like, you think you truly have a 50% chance of making it go out and try it. And as you do that, you're going to learn something about yourself because you're going to get put in this position where you're like, man, I can't do this. This sucks. I'm going to fail, but you keep putting one foot in front of the other. And all of a sudden what you thought was your limit, you'll go past it and you'll look and you're like, oh wait, now my limit has extended. Right. So you really learn something about yourself. You don't, we don't get that in modern life anymore. So we got to re-engineer that back into it. Yeah. And, and you hear, you hear the term, you know, mental toughness. And if, if that isn't building it, I don't know what is, you know, cause it's, it's getting past those mental barriers and those things that when you think that you can't do anymore, but you actually can. Yeah. You, you totally. know, and, and that's, yeah, I, I thought that was, I've never heard that term before and hearing those stories and the different types of misogies that, that he was doing was just, it was I don't know. It was just, it was interesting. Like I was like, man, those are some creative things that sound like they suck. (laughs) Yeah, they, they definitely should suck. But again, it's like one of those things where you look back and you're like, man, I didn't think I could do that. Yeah. I sold myself short. I was able to do it. Or maybe you didn't even finish it. Right. Cause 50, 50, this means about every other one you should be failing. Yeah. But I guarantee you'll at least be able to be like, well, I got way further than I thought I was going to be. And if I've been selling my short myself short in this kind of stuff in my life, like what else am I selling myself short on? Yeah. You know? And it also kind of tells you something about fear. I think, you know, in, in modern life, a lot of times our fears are like, oh, I'm going to give a bad presentation at work or, you know, my boss is going to be pissed at me for X, Y, Z. Whereas in the past we had like these real fears, right? Like, like fear was like, I might get, attacked by a tiger or I might starve to death. So it also helps us reset and reframe the fears that we kind of face in modern life. And you realize like, Oh, it's not that big of a deal. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like when you're, when you're in Alaska and, and you're, you know, you say you get a caribou like you did and you're like, well, how close should I have my meat to the meat to the camp? Because I want it close enough that deters grizzly bears, but I don't want it too close where they're coming in the tent. You know, it's like, yeah, totally. You know, those are, those are a different type of fear than like you said, like, you know, I just thinking again, personal experience right, you know, right now I'm preparing for a presentation I have to do for the CEO of the company. And it's like, that is a, a different kind of fear that really isn't, isn't, is not even close to being the same. <laughs> yeah, totally. And so it can help you kind of like reframe that. And I'll tell you what, if you, 
if you want some fears, go hunting with Donnie because he just keeps all the meat in the teepee. He's just like, yeah, eh, he, bears, they're not going to come in. Eh, we're fine. You know, he's just so like flippant about them. And I'm like, and honestly, his like his point of view on them, it just kind of made me be like, oh, I guess we're probably going to be fine. You know, like yeah. I didn't worry about him because he was just so like confident. They're like, nah, dude, they're not going to bother us. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, I mean, Donnie just, I, I've only talked to him once in, in length when I, and I did the podcast with him and we chatted afterwards for a while, but he, he sounds a lot like my, my hunting partner, Michael, that I go with where like, so when we were going up to Alaska and I was talking about grizzlies and, you know, things we have to do to stay safe and thinking about it. And he's like, I don't know why you're worried about grizzlies. He's like, he, he gives me some stat on how many planes go down, you know, every, you know, bush planes and stuff. And I'm like, man, like, you know, chill out here. And he wanted to put the, the meat in the tent too. And I was like, let's, let's, let's go like middle ground here. Let's, let's keep it about 30 yards away. You know, let's, and we did some other things to deter them, you know, and, and the one morning we woke up and we were walking through camp and I saw him kick something. And, and I uh, looked down, I was like, is that, is that grizzly shit? And he's like, he's like, uh, and he started changing the, the subject and I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's fresh. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just trying to get it out of the way, you know, yeah. and <laughs> it's, there, there is a level of comfort when you're hunting with people like that though. Like I'm sure when you were done, even though like, all right, this is kind of seems a little bit odd putting the meat in the tent, but you almost feel safe at the same time because like they have so much confidence in it that it kind of runs over. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, I mean, he's a great person to go with because he's been in so many different crazy situations that like nothing phases him. It's just kind of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like we, even when we would have like super dangerous stuff happen, like one night we had just these crazy hurricane force winds hitting our teepee and had to do like this emergency takedown and like was super sketchy. Yeah. Could we lost the teepee? Like we would have been totally exposed and who knows for how long, you know? And he was just very much like very matter of fact, like, okay, here's what we're going to do. And then, you know, whatever we did it. Whereas I think some other people would just freak out and panic and it would not go well. Um, but the other thing that's hilarious about Donnie is <laughs> he's great out there, but you put him in the modern world and he's kind of just like, you know, he's <laughs> like, not quite, <laughs> he's not quite there, not firing on all cylinders all the time in the modern world. You know, there's like a lot coming at him and it's like, you can tell he definitely gets overwhelmed by like, Oh, I got to, you know, my coworker says, I got to post something to Instagram. He's like, I hate Instagram. I hate, you know, like just, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> yeah, that is, that yeah. is funny. And, and yeah, he, he was telling me a little bit about that and, and, you know, like, or, you know, traffic or anything else. It's just like, that's the whole dip. He spent, I mean, he spends more days outside than he probably does indoors You're yeah, around, he, around people. Yeah. He probably spends like a half a year out of that teepee that he always brings around and the rest so. in his cabin is cabin in wisconsin there that he yeah. has that's that's incredible <laughs> yeah for sure um so i just want to transition here the, the one of the the last things i wanted to talk to you about was rucking so mm -hmm. i have not got to that chapter in the book yet but you've been posting a lot on Instagram and I know that I'm pretty sure you're friends with my trainer who's Todd Bumgardner. Mm -hmm. and Love Todd. Yeah. Todd's an, he's an awesome guy. And I, I, I've gotten to know Todd a lot over the last, I don't know, four or five months really is when I, I met him and I've been told about him from a friend of mine that is, trains with him for a long time. And he's an, an incredible person human being and trainer and everything else. And, and I, I want to hear your thoughts on rucking. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I'll say that you are in good hands with Todd, like having spent so many years at men's health, you kind of learn who's who. And, you know, and I learned it from people who were above me that just vetted everyone. And he's, I mean, he's freaking really good. Like you're in good hands. I'd recommend him to any, um, Hunter. I think he does remote coaching too. Yeah. And that's um, what he does for me is remote oh, coaching. Cool. Yep. Nice. Yeah. So rucking. So, <clears throat> okay. So kill a caribou. We have to pack it out right across the tundra. It's all uphill five miles, hundred something pounds. And you know, before I had gone up there, I had been aware of research that suggested the human body is built the way it is because we evolved to run long distances in the heat. So we, you know, we stand on two legs, we can sweat, 
We have all these different things that allow us to cool ourselves in the heat. Whereas most animals on four legs, they're way faster than us, but they suck at cooling themselves. So what we would do as we evolved to hunt is we would do this thing called persistence hunting. We would, uh, slowly, but surely run down an animal. We'd bump it. It would sprint away, but it would get really hot doing that. We'd slowly, but surely find it, bump it again. Eventually over time, after like 10 miles of this, the animal would just get too hot and it would topple over from exhaustion. We'd spear it. And then this is where I had this kind of insight. What would we have to do? We'd have to freaking carry it back to camp. Right? So this idea that we ran, we evolved to run long distances really popularized in the early two thousands, but no one's ever talked about, well, yeah, the, the second half of that is you got to carry heavy shit yeah. <laughs> across, the ter- across the terrain. Right. So I go meet, uh, I go to Harvard and I meet with this, uh, anthropologist who really studies like why we're built the way we are. He's the guy who did the original, um, running study that I mentioned. And it turns out that we are more so even born to carry things. So all the same adaptations that humans have uh, also make us good at carrying. There's no other, there's no other animal that's good at carrying, right? Like we have hands, our hands are really strong um, for, you know, compared to other animals and we can just carry stuff for a long distance at a time. And everybody, not everybody, but most people like run as a form of exercise, right? This is this like thing that we used to do in the past that we've reinserted into our lives. But how many people just like carry stuff for a long distance for a workout? Not many. No. Right. So I identify a tribe who does still carry, and that is special forces soldiers. So rucking is like the foundation of special forces training. Like I, uh, as one green beret put it, he goes, dude, the stuff that you see on the discovery channel, where there's like people doing pushups in the mud and getting yelled at, he's like, that's like one hour of two weeks. Like that is just, that's kind of like the highlight. Most of special forces training is land navigation where you have a heavy rock and you're having to go through crazy terrain. Cause that's like what happens in war, you know? And so I meet these guys and the guy who I was talking to that with, uh, founded the company go ruck. So he was a green beret. He realized that like, Hey, rucking is pretty good for people's fitness. How many people ruck for fitness? I'm going to start a backpack company that is like makes backpacks specific to rucking and he sells weight plates. So I go meet them and I just go down the rabbit hole of rucking. And, um, when you, I tend to think about it as cardio for people who hate to run and lifting for people who hate the gym. So it kind of gives you the best of both worlds of the cardio element. There's a strength element and you're like doing something that humans evolved to do. And those Harvard researchers think that that can be better for us. Cause it's like something we have evolved doing, you know what I mean? And, um, it also has a way lower injury risk compared to running. I mean, most people who run are going to get injured at some time. The injury injury rates anywhere from like 20 to 70%. Whereas with rucking, it's super low. It's like essentially the same as walking and most people can walk, you know, but you are still getting that strength element because when you look at humans today, the average person, we are like the most out of shape species in the history of the planet. Like we're, and it's crazy. Like so many of our health problems are linked to the fact that we just don't have to put effort into our days anymore because we've engineered all effort out because as we we're evolving. It didn't make sense to do any extra movement than we had to. We were forced into moving and working all the time. So we're wired to be lazy, but now we've engineered all the work out of our days. So it's like, we can just be lazy without having to offset it with work. So I think rucking is a really good way to sort of reintroduce that. And that's, what's also cool about hunting. It's like, you're going to be rucking, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And it's whether like, especially on like a Western hunt, whether that's, you know, packing in to say you're packing to a base camp or you're hunting the entire time with weight on your back, you're always traveling with, you know, 40 to 50 pounds at that time, or even on, you know, day hunts, you get, you know, 20 to 30 pounds on your back. And then when you have an animal down, then you have excess of a hundred pounds, you know, on your back. And, and like part of Todd's training with me this morning, that's what I, I did before work. You know, I had an hour of, or 45 minutes of rucking essentially, and, you know, covering ground and, and doing that. And it's, it's, 
it, it translates so much because there's so many different muscles and parts of your body you don't use even if you go to the gym every day and mm-hmm. do like that you don't you feel those discomfort discomforts all those different things and and it, yeah it helps out you know so much with with all of that and being able to go across you know when you you you've done it you know when you go on a hunt and you're traveling on uneven terrain and you're going up and down and you know side hill and on rocks and everything else and you got weight on your back and trying to keep you know your body stable and everything else there's so many different things that 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 helps with yeah totally and it's interesting because you know i talk about in the book that we've even made the gym comfortable it's like it's temperature controlled there's all these machines where it's like you put your, you know, your legs or your arms on these perfect pads and like, you know, move this weight that you have pre-selected across a very fixed plane of motion, or you go on an elliptical, which is like this machine that's like never seen in nature. And you just kind of zone out, you know? Um, so we've even made the gym, the gym comfortable. And I think that, you know, I talked to, there was a guy that I was talking to up in Alaska and, he does some, um, doll sheep hunts, which are pretty gnarly. And he talked about like, he'll get texts from clients who are like, yeah, you know, I'm going to the gym every single day, you know, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. And he's like, dude, they'll get out here and they'll quit after like a day because they are just not used to having weight on their back. And the other thing is that like, look, if you're training indoors, like the stress of a hunt, isn't just the physical element. It's the fact that like, it's going to be freezing cold. You're going to be hungry. You're also going to have like to do this physical work and it's just, it's too much on your system. So if you're only training inside the gym, I think you're definitely missing something. It's going to be harder for you. I mean, when you're only training when conditions are perfect, like Mm -hmm. that's, that's a whole nother thing. Cause I mean, most of the time, like what I've learned from the most successful hunters that I've been able to interview and everything are the ones that are able to grind it out until the end. You know, a lot of times they're not successful until the last day of their hunt or they have some Mm -hmm. crazy story. I remember Donnie telling a story about where I can't remember how far you had to pack out this doll sheep and doing this, you know, there's, there's a lot you're, you're doing to, to be, you know, successful just specifically with hunting. It has to do when you're in uncomfortable situations, it's cold, it's raining, it's doing that. Like anytime that I can find like as much as I hate doing it, but when it's like, of like, oh man, it's raining out this morning. I really don't want to throw my backpack on and, you know, go for this hike. But when you do it, you feel good afterwards. Like, you know, again, anytime after you work out, you feel good, but it helps you when those situations arise, it's not such a shock. And yeah, you're, you realize, you, you know, you're able the world. Yeah. You know, you're able to push through it. Yeah. So, Amen, man. Yeah. Amen. Well, awesome. Michael, I, I appreciate you coming on. I, I really, uh, would I'd really love to dive into just about everything of that book with you, but um, I, I appreciate all the the different things you've talked about here, and I and I definitely hope that anyone that's listening and you know your hunter or whatever else definitely recommend checking out your book. Hey, thanks a lot, man. Um, I really enjoyed coming on for people listening. It's called the Comfort Crisis. If you want to learn more about me, I'm on Instagram. I try to stay a little bit off, but I have to, I'm told by my publisher. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm at a uh, Michael underscore Easter. My website is eastermichael.com. And yeah, man, I really appreciate you having me on. That was fun. Yeah. And so where, where can people find your book at as far as uh, purchasing it? If, if they want to get the audio yeah. book or they want to get the hard copy, how, how do they do that? So it's available pretty much anywhere books are sold. I know a lot of people do audible it's on there. Um, I think that, uh, like Apple, there's something called Apple books too, that has it. I don't know. Just anywhere you can get books. They'll yeah. have it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it, that makes it simple. Yeah. But anyways, again, thank you for coming on and, uh, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.